Hey guys, on this episode we head down to Florida to run the Florida Adventure Trail. Follow along as we get into some trouble on the way home on an old logging road. We also run into a lot of mud holes and deep water on this trip. I honestly had no idea how deep this was, but luckily the new AEB snorkel came in handy. So follow along as the story starts now. <laughs> Good morning, we are on our way to Florida to run the eastern side of the Florida Adventure Trail. And right off the bat, we got a Toyota Tacoma with the rooftop tent, which is cool. But what's really cool is in front of that is a third gen RX-7 on a trailer. One of my ultimate dream cars, I always wish I had one, but man, see those anymore. I love those RX-7s. James, say hi to YouTube. Hi. Where are we going, James? <laughs> you don't know? You're just along for the ride? Yeah. Well, we are going to Florida, and we're meeting up with Steven and his uh, Gladiator. It's been a while since we did a trip with him. Always seem to just be working on his rig. And then, who else is coming? Satish? Satish is coming in his Forerunner, and we have Justin, his uh, EcoBoost uh, F-150, which, you know, we haven't done a lot of stuff with him lately either, so that's cool. And uh, we got to beat this traffic here and meet up with Steven on the other side of Columbia, and then shoot over to 95. Get down! Get down! Hazard ahead! After we cleared the hazards, we met up with Steven and his youngest son, Ben, and headed down 95. Welcome to Georgia. Alright, we arrived at the meetup point. Probably going to air down here at the gas station. This is a Circle K. What are you doing, James? Well, this is what happens when you bring all your toys out and pick them up. So, we're here at the Circle K. Uh, this is the furthest southeastern part of the Florida Adventure Trail, the FAT. And we're waiting for Justin and Satish, so we're going to air down our tires. Since this is all just going to be mud pits and sand, we're airing down these 37s to about um, let's go 20 PSI on these. So this is the end deflate and factory. I run about 40 pounds on the highway. And these pop caps right here are a new addition. And they just pop on, pop off, very easy. So I'm gonna hook these up to the front tires and then just pull up on this and it's gonna start letting air out. Really? Really? 85 degrees outside and your AC doesn't want to work. You need, you need a good mechanic. Satish has a lot of the problem with this Toyota. Hopefully the F-150 makes it. Justin's F-150. All right, we're airing down. This is the part where we go from pavement onto sand. We got some mud holes and a water crossing to go through before camp. We're on the Florida Adventure Trail, the FAT, and we are on some sand runs.
we'll check in at the uh, first obstacle, which should be a mud pit. Now, there's a controlled burn going on on our left, um, coming down the first part of the trail. Hello. And James says hello. So, trying to make it to camp at uh, Hawkins Prairie by six. We'll see what happens. We got control burning up here. This section of trail had some really soft, what they call sugar sand, that we had a lot of fun going up through. Also, all the control burns kind of took away from the scenery. All right, uh, water crossing that is dry. So this is the water crossing in between the two mud crossings. <laughs> it's dry. We got a kind of a late start. If you guys want to start on the uh, most southeastern side, I recommend starting more in the morning probably around 8 or 9 o'clock. We had to skip some little small sections, but we didn't skip any of the major obstacles listed on the Florida Adventure Trail map, which you can download from the link in the description below. This section, we've watched videos before where a lot of this was extremely muddy and uh, lots of water, but we obviously didn't see a lot of water or mud, so we had pretty high hopes that most of these water crossings would be pretty shallow. Once we got into Ocala uh, National Forest, we ran into a bunch of these straight line roads where they seemed to go on forever but we know where we're headed. We stayed here before at Hawkins Prairie and I knew the way. Head north toward FR 33. Continue for two miles. It is really tight back in here and you will get some pinstripes and there is a little bit of maneuvering through some tight trees in here but if you didn't know this place was here you drive right by it but all of a sudden you come around a corner to this beautiful prairie and there's some nice camp spots out here too. There's a lot of dispersed camping around Hawkins Prairie. There's also a campsite on the other side and there's a premium camp spot right here at a little canoe put in. Um, that is probably the best spot over here, but we stayed at the same spot that we stayed at about two years ago at about this time of the year as well. I have fit a full-size Tundra through here before but anything bigger than a full-size truck, you're gonna have issues. Cotty Wample Overland must have stayed here before because once we got to camp, it started raining. Yeah. What? Oh, sorry. So we get to camp. It is 5:40, and the second we cold, pulled in camp, it started raining. Looks like it's gonna blow over though. It's all clear over there. So we got the awning out, and we are right on Hawkins, Hawkins Prairie. The rain finally let up and we were able to sit down, cook some dinner, 
and build the fire and sit around the campfire and catch up with some old friends, meet some new friends, and get excited about what tomorrow will bring. I slept so well that night, I don't even recall it raining. But we woke up to a beautiful view of the prairie and Stephen starting some breakfast. Bacon grease. That's the way to do it. Alright, so we're on day two. It's almost 10 o'clock here. We had a late morning just because of uh, all the rain everywhere. So, we had to rush through, bypass uh, some of the stuff. Um, we still had a lot of fun. The two mud holes and the water crossing were pretty much all dried up. It was just a little bit of mud. But we're gonna go take our picture at the bombing range, run that little short section of the uh, Deep Badge of Honor Trail, and then go hopefully have lunch at that barbecue place. So, onward. So here's the start of the only Florida Jeep Badge of Honor trail that I know of. I'm pretty sure this is the only one in Florida, but this is the start of it. And if you follow it, it actually is gonna lead up to a bombing range right over there. And um, we're gonna go check that out. That's Hatisha's Forerunner. Steven's Gladiator and Justin's EcoBoost F-150. And this is the start of the Jeep Badge of Honor Trail. He's, Justin's got to get amber lights before he's picture ready. That water is deep, but it's not, you don't have to hit the brakes, you can go through it. JLs and JT Jeeps have what I call Baja mode. So you can go ahead and put the vehicle down into four high and then you could select um, off-road plus mode. And when your vehicle's in four high, it keeps the revs up and it disables part of the traction control so you can slide out around corners and it's meant for this kind of terrain, uh, the sand. Here at the Ocala National Forest, there's a bombing range ran by the U.S. Navy. There's three to four gates uh, that you can pull up to and take pictures at. Believe me, there's cameras everywhere, and I believe 
It's not active anymore, but I believe there is still military personnel on grounds. Part of the Florida Adventure Trail leads down some very narrow roads that will put some pinstripes on your vehicle. This is one part of it which was extremely tight. I can't imagine how tight this trail can get in the summer months with full vegetation. After exiting out of Ocala National Forest, we stopped for fuel on the north end and stopped to get some lunch too at a local taco place. Now it's uh, labeled on the map, but definitely stop in here because it's a local family owned place with some awesome, awesome food. Cheese and chips? Yeah. Salad. Well, they already ate all their food, so did Dash. No, he's got half of a there. Cowboy quesadilla? So wait, I'm on to. Cowboy quesadilla. After stuffing ourselves at Odd Todd's restaurant, or it's technically a food truck, you get on the highway for a little bit, and then you're going to turn right onto this sandy road um, that runs across some power lines for a couple miles. The sand around here got super soft in some areas, but it was not an issue at all. At the end of this section, you're going to turn left, and there are some muddy and some water holes that you're going to have to cross to continue on. So there is some fun on this section as well. There you go. Yes. So this part of the trail just runs along the power lines. And it's bumpy. All right, James, hold on. Sit, sit down, sit down. Sit down. So with the taser, you can unlock the sway bar permanently through the steering wheel commands. So we got the sway bar unlocked no matter what speed we're at, which helps a lot with the comfort. 
just don't be whipping it around corners because you'll flip over. And then off-road plus mode, when you're in four high, off-road plus mode puts it in like Baja. So it puts it in Baja mode, which keeps the RPMs up. Let's yeah. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> Increases throttle response and turns the traction control off. Turns the traction control off so you can really let the rear end spin around. Let me uh, make sure I'm gonna when I when it's gonna cut off. Alright, hold on, James. This by far was the deepest and longest water crossing that we did on this trip. If you do come from this direction, stay to the passenger side it's a little bit more shallow and there might be a log there on the left tree line side we find out later justin sucked up water into his intake past his air filter on this crossing stephen and benjamin both had a blast on this trip I can't wait to do another trip with them soon because we all had a really good time together. We all got super nervous when Satish started sliding sideways coming up out of this mud hole. That water crossing was so deep. Yeah, that was great. That was so good. So, we got really good footage. Oh, it looks like there's another one up here. We got really good footage with the drone. Satish almost didn't make it. He was bogged down over his I hood. Think, wait, wait. I think he almost crewed. Like, I think he almost went out Alright, Justin started getting a flashing check engine light. We pulled the um, air box out. The air filter is completely soaked wet. We have water in the uh, intercooler tube. So we blew it all out. And we're going to go head up the street to AutoZone and get a new air filter for him. Everybody needs to know only only submarines need snorkels. If this would have fallen apart and went through my turbo, it would have been uh, would have been a bad day. Oh yeah. Thanks Jason. I owe you a big one. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, there was O'Reilly's Auto Parts within 15 minutes, so we can get Justin a couple of new air filters and get us back on the trail. Coming into this, I never checked the water level. It just said bridge bypass, and I just assumed it was shallow enough. Be okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really deep. <laughs> it went over my hood. I just went all the way in. Uh, passenger side a little bit. 
I didn't get much video recording after that water crossing as we were running out of daylight. We made it as far north as Interstate 10 and started looking for our campsite. There are several in the area, but when we got to the actual camp, we went to Hob Hunt Camp. And when we got there, it started torrential downpour. The temperature drastically dropped. And some of us weren't feeling well, so we decided to call it there and actually head the four to six hours back home. Um, Satish and Justin, they took off and went left, and Steven was behind me as the only way out back to I-95 was a road called Harold Dobson Road, and it ended up being an old logging road that was completely saturated in mud, and there was a bunch of logging trucks that the truckers disconnected their load and left them there on the side of the road be because the mud was so bad they couldn't get through. But we pushed on and then shortly realized that we made a mistake and decided if we stopped we were in trouble or if we slid into a ditch we were in trouble. So the only thing we do is bear down and stay on the throttle and not fly off the road. Thankfully, Benjamin got some great footage from sitting shotgun on this section of the trail because both of us were so focused on keeping the Jeeps on the road, we didn't have time to set up any cameras or anything, but I wanted to capture this because it was probably some of the most intense driving. made it. So we ended up getting to I-95, airing up, my compressor died. Um, we ended up getting sick. So we ended up making it back home in the early hours of the morning. All right, we just got back from the Florida trip. A couple things. One, those big China lights. The lenses have water in them now, and this one won't turn on. That one will turn on, but it flickers, and then the side things will flicker on that. So with the water in the lenses, I think they're done. Um, the Baja designs, no fog, nothing. Great quality. You get what you pay for with that. Um, this right here, now I did try to mangle it, open it up, but see the fuse kind of melted. So it did its job, it did blow, but this runs my ARB compressor in the back, so something's causing too much of a draw on that, so I gotta ohm out this wire and make sure nothing got stuffed, and then uh, look at the ARB compressor and see what's going on with that. But I did get this to replace that, and if this one pops, you can just manually reset it like this. So if it happens again, I don't have to try and find a fuse. I do have a fuse for this, but it melted the housing, so what's the point, right? Um, it might have just got too hot and melted the housing, or it could have just been getting hot regardless over, you know, the year I've had this already, and it just kind of got too hot, and this was the resistance in blue. So, we're going to replace that, we're going to check the ARB compressor. Now my horn, when I would press the horn, like the lock, it sounded like a dying goose. So then you press the main horn, and it was just like low, like messed up. So I figured I had water in the horn, and I already took it apart because you gotta kind of drop the rate, do the, uh, you gotta undo the two bolts on top of the radiator, kind of lean that back, and then there's a 10 millimeter on each side to take the horns out. So you took the horns out, and they're full of water. So I dumped them out, blew them out with the compressed air. I tried to get compressed air just up in there, but you have to turn them upside down to get all the water off. So 
we got all the water out, the horn's back to normal. Uh, we're going to repair that, and we're probably going to just end up ordering um, new lights. Um, I'm probably going to go clear on it because I'm not a fan of the amber. Because I already got, I'm going to keep the amber down there. So we're going to see if we can get new ones. Um, kind of want to bite the bullet and get the, um, the uh, AEV ones, but we'll see. As always, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next video. Good night.